Stephanie. I am so excited to talk to you. I've been looking forward to this interview for a while because I, I love your paintings and I've loved looking at them for a long time. So thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Thrilled. Yeah, I have. I, I'm I'm excited, and I I just shared with Stephanie that I was so excited when I was able to meet her. Uh, she was at John Walker's opening just this past year, and we were introduced. And I automatically knew I was like, I have to get Stephanie on the show because, um, you didn't know, but I've been watching, looking at your paintings for a while, so it was exciting for me. <laughs> oh man! So Stephanie, we're just gonna jump right into it, and. How I really love to start these interviews is by hearing a little bit more about you and your background. So could you share a little bit um, with us about where you're from, a little bit of that background and how you first became introduced to the arts? Okay, um, so thank you again for having me. It's really so generous, I think, for you to spend so much time with artists and curators and gallerists and to 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 get into the heads of other makers and thinkers. And it's just always surprising sometimes when people want to spend an hour listening to you talk about what you do. So thank you. Um, so I, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and I my family was not you know, educated. We were very working class family. There was an exposure to art in my family, but from a very young age, I knew that I was interested in in painting and drawing. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I sometimes overlook this surprisingly, but I had a friend whose mother was a painter and she was a graphic artist by, you know, her career was how she got paid, but she made art and she was connected with artists in this scene of artists in Midtown Memphis that I did get exposure to at that age, but I already had known I wanted to be a painter. So knowing her was just, wow, it just fed me, you know? So her, her you know, in her house, her one of the, the rooms downstairs was her studio and you had to go through it to go to the other rooms in the house. And so I was always kind of taking in, what's it like in that world that she makes things in, you know? Um, all these, she, she used those tube watercolors and her work, you know, was of the things around her in the world. And she had works by her friends who did interesting, weird, like paper cast things. And we would go to openings and a few plays and things that I'd never, never, ever would have been exposed to in my family, which was just, you know, we didn't, it just didn't exist. Um, so she was hugely, I think, important and her name is Debbie Collins and she's still alive and I'm still friends with her we have this like very cool. sweet yeah very sweet um exchange she was actually texting me this morning and we both garden and we you know it's just this very lucky relationship and I have another person like that who was my high school mentor Bill Hicks who is really the first person who formally taught and trained me he is this phenomenal singular human being who's very well informed about painting and art and many things and is v extremely critical like more critical than anyone I know um and he's you know very opinionated he's also still alive I still have a very close friendship with him and just am so grateful for it. so it's interesting that it was a woman and a man who it's like my parents you know my art parents um and they're both just incredibly beautiful people um, with careers, you know, with, you know, careers, you know, Bill Hicks did a Fulbright and did his MFA at MICA and things like that. Um, so Bill taught me all of the, all of the fundamentals of painting and drawing and um, working from observation. Everything was really rooted in that with him. And, uh, you know, beyond that in undergrad, I went to the Art Institute of Boston and, um, I studied with a few people there that were, I think, really nurturing and really important to to pushing me along, you know, and then in grad school, the same. Um, and in grad school, you know, I think working with Denzel Hurley and um, Riley Brewster and Ann Gale and Helen O'Toole, those people were really strong, strong people who in the studio challenged me in the best ways. Mm, I love that. And um, 
I love hearing about your background in observational painting and making. That's my background as well. And I, when you said art parents, I feel like when you grow up uh, making it an observational framework that those people really do kind of become your parents. I feel like they're, I don't know. It's interesting. I feel like there's a lot built around being an observational painter and that those personalities are always really strong, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I do. I think also because there usually comes along with it a very strong criteria of what is good and what is bad, which mm -hmm. can also have a limitation to it that at some point, you, you know, I think there was, there was definitely a point that I had to throw that off um, to, to think about what was important to me and what was interesting to me. And um, interestingly, over time, the things that I, there were core things that stayed, but there were other things that I really strongly rejected. You know, there were people that we were looking at um, who at the, you know, at that time, I was like in love with, and I wanted to be those painters, you know, um, and I borrowed everything I could from them. And then eventually I shed it, you know, I really rejected it and, um, other things started to speak to me. Mm, I love that. Yeah. And I feel like as, as we grow as artists, right, there is that ability to take things in. And I love how you said shed it, you know, like it, it was part of you at a certain time and then you've grown and now it's, it's being left behind. Um, and again, I think that's a, a big thing in the observational world um, of, of people who are coming in and who we're learning from. And, and like you said, learning from. Um, so I want to get into your work right now. I love looking at your paintings. I've been able to see them in person a while ago. And of course, looking at them now online, there's just so many layers that I begin to see in your work. And so, you know, one of the first questions I have for you is how do you go about starting a piece of yours? Like, how do you begin? Is it a drawing? Do you just, um, know what you're going to be painting from? How does that, how does that, what does that look like for you? It is a long um, a long process of a lot of anxiety before I even begin. Um, I usually am pacing around, looking around, trying to figure out like what can be the starting point. And sometimes I'm lucky because I'll be in a space that I have a relationship going with that I haven't exhausted that I, I know like I can, I can pick up in this point here and I don't know where it's going to go yet, but this will be the start. And I never know where they're going to go. Um, uh, it's kind of excruciating to me, to be honest. I hate starting. Once I get started, once I have, once I'm in it from the, you know, I think within the first 10 minutes, then I'm like, okay, I'm in a painting. And then of course I have pauses along the way, but it's the starting that's the hardest part for me. Um, I think because I don't know where it's going to end up and I don't know if, I don't know what the subject is yet often until I've been in the painting for a long time. Um, I have a painting right now that I've started differently, which is very unusual for me, which came from a moment uh, driving in a car and seeing this crazy light in space. And there was so much in it. I quickly, I took a few photos, but I got home and I didn't look at the photos and I just drew it from memory. Um, and then I've started a painting from it that I'm using the drawing and the memory. And I've looked at the the photos just a few times to see like, where, what is there? And then I put it away. I won't reference it, but that is a total anomaly. And I have no idea yet how I'm going to pull the painting off. Um, or if, it, if it will lead to other paintings like that. Normally the paintings are uh, not knowing tackling in these layers and they never have drawings beforehand. They never have a preliminary thing to them. Um, and so what they are is a layer that I work in a very fast drying medium, their oil paint with a fast drying medium. And then as I layer them, the layers never totally conceal what's beneath. So there's always this conversation from the very, very beginning of the painting. Um, and so they are, the spaces become 
I hope, you know, very intricate and complicated and also allow you as a viewer to see um, the way that you see it is is kind of up to your eye and how you're receiving it rather than it's very fixed as this is the positive form, this is the negative space. And my work, it's it's kind of fluidly, I think, able to shift spatially. I love that because that was one of the questions I had is um, when I'm looking at your work, there's this play on space that begins to happen in my eye, you know, where something comes to the surface, another thing pushes back and then it flips. And I was thinking of like this, this fragmentation of space that begins to occur. Uh, and, and also how when I'm looking at your paintings, because of that fragmentation, it's almost like the outside becomes the inside, you know, when there's like a window, um, at, or I was looking at some of your book paintings, which I love and, and the edge and how it begins to like dissolve almost into what it's sitting on. Um, so I was hoping you could, you could expand on that and talk a little bit more about space in your paintings and how it's being, um, how you're kind of building it and sharing it with the viewer. I don't know how to answer it because I don't even know how I do it often, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. as I'm painting, I'm thinking I get kind of, there are points where I'm, I have no words in my brain, which is the best place. And I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing what's happening and I'm saying yes or no to it, you know? So sometimes it's a push back at something. It may be that things feel too fixed and too, or too described or, um, too known. And so I have to keep testing everything in there to feel, to get it to a point that I feel like I can actually open the form up, you know, to where it has edges that are not solid and it gets to dissolve a little bit more into the space and light of the painting. And, and, you know, we were talking about things that I shed and things that I had borrowed from you know, early on how you learn through other painters, you know, when I was young, I was looking at um, painters, you know, it really started out with painters like, I mean, literally in high school, we were looking at Lucian Freud, Francis Bacon, and de Kooning, and all of the Bay Area painters, and um, people like Sargent and other modernists like Matisse, but I, you know, I heavily took in I, I loved de Kooning and I loved Lucian Freud I those two like stayed loves for a long time and in grad school I, I think up to that point I had done some life on my own outside of between grad and undergrad and a lot of different possibilities came up in my work at that during that time but I didn't know how to go forward with it it would I would I would feel like I didn't have a gauge for good or bad and I also didn't know how to take the next step forward um so grad school really helped me push through that and um to to have an a, a feeling of um not knowing being a good place to be and to to keep going inside of that deeper inside of whatever that thing is so in grad school, I started making paintings that I changed my surface. Um, I had been working always on gesso and I started using oil ground at the recommendation of a, of a good painter friend, Kimberly Trowbridge, which at the time I thought, why would I, what, what difference is it going to make? I'm going to cover it in painting and paint and it's going to be thick. You won't even see it. But the surface, it was like, as soon as I touched it and put color on it, it wanted to do something different. And it, it also immediately it was like a transparent color on there did something with light that the gesso didn't do and that touch that like immediate touch sensation and and what the paint did on the surface totally changed how i thought about applying paint and the body of paint and and then what what kind of pigments i wanted to use like using transparent looking for transparent pigments not only opaque pigments and and not relying on <clears throat> this language of impostoed brush strokes to be the heavy kind of expressive language that I had inherited from all of these people I had looked at, you know? Um, so they just got, they, they, they pulled away from that and I started doing some collages and the language started to influence how I thought about a mark and a painting and, um, things that just started to excite me or interest in me, interest me and were things that I thought, what if I did that? Or this is 
strange and surprising. I'm going to go into that a little more. You know, it was like those things in the process that that helped the work, I think, become whatever they are now. I love that you said not knowing being a good place to be. I love that because it can be such an uncomfortable place to be, you know, but that is where so much can happen in your work. And so I, I highlighted that. I was like, oh, that is so good. What Stephanie said there. Um, and you started talking about, uh, you know, taking away that impasto type of making and brushstroke and building like those forms, you know, um, and that was something else I really love seeing in your work is how there can almost be like, um, a brushstroke of an underpainting where you're kind of laying something out and then you allow that to kind of come through. There might be some transparent uh, passages over it, but you can still kind of see those lines from it. Um, and I think that is, that's incredibly beautiful. And um, I was looking at one of your pieces. Um, it has the moon on the left side that's kind of moving through there. Mm-hmm. And you, do, you ha- do you have it in yeah. your space right yeah. now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about that piece? Um, and what I what I what I was really seeing, kind of taking away from it, was this idea of the brush stroke and those transparencies, light, but also like the idea of time, because you have like the moon kind of moving. So could you talk a little bit about that piece and time and surface? Yeah, I feel like that's this the core of what I'm thinking about in the work is the passage of time, and it started in when I lived. Between, I went to grad school in Seattle and I moved um, to Northwest Arkansas and I lived in Fayetteville in a small college town where I taught for a long time, pretty much a decade. And mm-hmm. um, I had a studio there that was the longest inhabited space I've ever had in my whole life and also my art life, um, but definitely my whole life. So I was in the same studio for probably eight years, eight or nine years. And it was an amazing thing for me who's never stayed in one place ever, not where I lived or worked. Um, And to have this, I had this corner of a studio that I, that I painted in that was um, the point in my point in the world. And I formed a relationship there between light and time and the way that light shifted during the seasons. So as I went back to this point in space that I at first was painting a bed in that space and, and radios and um, sometimes plants and it became about the light moving through the space and shedding a lot of things just to look at how that light moved and tracking that when I was younger um, in undergrad, I didn't mention I had gone to Norfolk and at Norfolk, I had met Gideon Bach, whose paintings were really influential on me. And he is a person and as like a person talking in the studio also influenced me a lot because he was so earnest and um, there wasn't an an expected um, answer to things. And he kind of lived his life that way, painted his paintings that way, talked about painting in that way. And it was really refreshing Um, and, and kind of helped me see, that I, I didn't have to put in front of me a bigger um, answer to things in some way. I don't know how to put that into words well, but um, so as I was, as I was painting the light, well, back to, back to how that influenced me when I was an undergrad, I was painting these urban landscapes of traffic cars moving in space and I had a studio for a brief amount of time in undergrad that looked down on Kenmore Square in Boston it was like a five-way intersection and um I I was so excited about the things I couldn't hold on to it it felt it felt related to something I get excited about in music and um still think is compelling in music and it and it relates to space you know like the, in, in music when it can be really extremely layered, very discordant, have a structure that's holding, but also have something that's unraveling and uh, breaking apart in a way where things kind of split off into their own thing. And then it kind of coalesces and comes back together. I think about that visually and in terms of light and space similarly. Um, And I was making those paintings of things moving in space. I think I was trying too hard to, um, to fix them a little bit. Uh, 
and it, it's something that came back up as I was tracking the light in the studio was it, it was a thing that was impossible to capture and incredibly beautiful in a, in a, in a way that I couldn't, I, I, I was, I maintained my interest in it. I never stopped being fascinated by it, you know? Um, so those paintings became about this, the light moving through the space. Those were like, I don't know. I don't know when I started making them, maybe 10, 12 years ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe longer. Mm -hmm. I can't remember, but that idea of things moving and that a painting can be a record of time rather than a moment in time became pretty important to me. Yeah, thinking about a record in time and that overlap that you have and just seeing that moon and the light around it, how it expands and changes, I just thought was really beautiful. And, and for me as a viewer of your work, I feel like that's a big takeaway that I always have is I don't feel like I'm looking at a moment, like a single like moment in time, but rather moments that there might be a day in between them. There might be minutes in between them. Um, but that's something that's left to me to begin to decipher and think about. Um, and then of course, if, in my mind, I also kind of go to you, the painter, in thinking about how long you stood in front of, of that moonscape or whatever it is and seeing it shift. And I think there's like a beautiful humanity in that, like a connection that can happen outside of the painting. I don't know. Um, but I love, I love hearing you talk about things that are impossible to capture, right? Like, how do you capture that? <laughs> yeah. People often ask me, do you use photos? And when I was younger, I did, I didn't use them because I wanted to copy them. I used them because I could reference something I couldn't get in front of and be at. And I don't use them now. And I, and I don't feel I just feel it would kill what is interesting to me and what I'm trying to do. I'm not interested in making the image as eventually there is an image and, and some more recent paintings there are, they feel more rooted in having an image of things, but um, I am, I'm more interested in the potential for how it can talk about time and light and color. You know, the image is, it's got to go beyond whatever's there in front of me. And, I, and it's not about describing, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like kind of elevating what is kind of there. It's not about like, this is a cup and this is the exact image of a cup. Yeah. It's the experience of, of the cup or whatever's there, which I think is like beautiful. And that makes me think about your, your day in the studio. I just saw on Instagram that you were out painting, you know, um, can you just talk about like a day in your life in the studio or painting on site or what that kind of looks like for you? Yeah. Um, basically when I'm, when I'm given the time and I get to just be in the studio, I, um, the only thing. I don't even know how to describe it. I have my palette set usually. Um, and then I'm diving in. Once I'm diving in, I'm there in in front of whatever it is that I'm referencing, except for that painting I mentioned. Um, I'm I'm at the source of the of the subject and I'm I'm just standing and painting for all day, you know, as the light changes. It used to be that I would work within a bracket of time or I'd have like, you know, a, a window that I thought this is a good time or I might be interested even when day turned to night and the kind of flipping around of everything and how impossible that is and how exciting that is and what that could give to a painting. Um, and I, I do that now, but it's less, um, there's something more open about it now like I, sometimes my paintings don't, you wouldn't know time of day. You have indicators of things, but it doesn't sit within a bracket, you know? Um, but then in, in terms of process, it's just painting. It's just painting and then long looking, you know, really long looking and um, trying to see what the painting is doing and trying to get around the, um, there'll be a way that I'm, there'll be a part that I'm fixated on that I'm thinking is doing a certain thing that I'll, I might, that might be like compelling me forward. Um, 
but I have to also see how that thing is working in the in the rest of the painting and think about all of the things that might happen to make that more intense, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know how to describe it. Like I paint in my studio every once in a while I paint outside in another space. So those photos on Instagram are from my backyard um, in Brooklyn and my yard is a garden and it's, uh, there are some flowers out there that are pro extremely prolific and they create this kind of wilderness of, of blooms, which they're doing right now. They're taller than me. There's these um, cut leaf rubecchias and uh, Jerusalem artichokes that are, they get up to 10 feet tall. They're, I mean, they're oh just, eight, I mean, they're eight <laughs> feet tall, at least definitely. They are tall, crazy plants um, and they can't be controlled. And once they start doing what they do, you're like, well, why? I don't even want to control you. You know, I'm just going to revel in the fact that when I walk out, I'm met with this like galaxy of flowers. So painting out there, I'm, you know, dragging all my stuff out, but luckily it's not too far to go. I'm covering myself in bug spray and <laughs> um, just getting in there and also hoping that my neighbors aren't blasting bachata or whatever, you know, there's like radio wars in my neighborhood where it's usually I'm very happy to hear the music, but when I'm painting, I, I want to hear there's something that will set a mood that I can focus in. And if it's, if I'm competing my thoughts with a lot of jarring things, that gets really hard. Mm. Do you listen to anything when you paint or are you, you're just like, can you share with us a little bit about what you listen to? Like, is it music, podcasts, books? You know, I always listen. It changes. I'm happiest when I'm listening to music, but I do listen to podcasts. Um, I listen to music more for a long time, for many, many years, when I lived in Arkansas, I listened to Who's Screw Do's Zen Arcade on repeat. It's a double album. And I listened to it. I mean, probably that was the, I listened to other things also, but that was the thing that was like, I would get the deepest in my working mind is listening to that. Um, and that was years, like a decade, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, I was, um, Chie Fueki a painter he probably know she was telling me that she likes it's not even an album she'll get a song and she'll listen to that song on repeat you know for a long long time and I love that I get because it'll you know I, I I feel that because there's a, a mood that things can um things that I need there's a mood I need to 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 feel and to paint so late lately love that. Weird, weirdly I've been um weirdly it's been Susie and the Banshees <laughs> um in like the, her first two records and I don't know there's certain songs on there that I wish I could edit out of the album just because it's a different jarring tone but that gets me there and then podcasts different podcasts you know mm -hmm. I'll follow different ones for a while and one that I found that um is cool to listen to because it's a real range of what you might learn about is called apology and it's about books and people's relationships to reading and you know throughout their life how they started reading what they're reading and how you know how that might influence whatever work they do I love that I always love hearing what people listen to and I feel like a lot of artists I know me included they'll be like years where you listen to one thing over and over and over. Like I have a friend, I mean, I've been out of grad school a long time. We went to grad school together. He still listens to the same album because <laughs> he's like, I just can totally zone out. You know, yes, I know what's yes. coming. I don't have to be like, oh, that was, it. you know, you just are like in it. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to to do it or anything. Suf John Stevens, Age of Ads was mine for a while. Like that was like my thing. I don't know why I could just like, it was weird. It was intense. I don't know, but you that is very cool. Message mm -hmm. that to me so I can listen to it. Um, Cause I've never heard it. I would love yeah. it. I, We should do some music trades, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another thing I got really obsessed with is um, I really love um punk music and also folk music like from around the world and really many kinds of music and it just depends I get sometimes I get on a thing and I go deep into it and so for a while since I lived here and during the pandemic um 
I came across some music from, um, what is it, former Yugoslavia. And so a lot of old things that would be related to punk, a band called Idoli, which is just an um, amazing, amazing. This one record is just so surprising and just fulfilled me you know I like listened to it on repeat repeat and other things surrounding that that era it was like early 80s former Yugoslavia like really really rich period of music there but also most of Eastern Europe I um went to Eastern Europe when I was 21 22 and um I guess it was 22 23 and I I just got really you know exposed to all of this music from the early 80s there and other other times and it never left like it just keeps feeding me hmm. yes I would love to hear this and maybe you can send it to me and I can put it um out there so other people can find it too because that sounds really really interesting yeah um so we've, we've been talking a lot about you know your process and your paintings and what we listen to we paint and I had this question come up recently and I'm asking artists because I'm, I'm really intrigued. Um, the question came up when I was with a bunch of painters is how do you know when a painting's done? Mm -hmm. And so now I I'm so curious, can you share, um, for you, when, when is a painting done? That is one of those questions that is always, um, fun to talk about and hard to answer. Um, <laughs> I think for me, I think it's when the painting is something that surprises me and I feel has gone further than what I've previously known. Mm -hmm. um, and so it may be a complexity of light and space. It may be that those things along with what I feel the pain, I've come to find what the subject of the painting is or some potential that the painting had for um developing on an abstract layer that um, starts to structure the painting in a way that that just makes it to me feel solidified. Um, I have a whole, I have many paintings going right now. I have, I don't even know how many, God, it's more than 12, you know? Um, yeah. And sometimes I'll have paintings that stay for years and I don't, ever I, it takes me a long time to to find what they are there's one painting that's going in my show right now that's um I've started painting on it in 2019 2018 2018 and so I'm just now finally arriving at what that painting is um mm -hmm. and it's it's taken a long time but I feel like it's one of those things you know like you suddenly see a thing that's confronting you or that's saying like there's something because it, painting is such a long conversation um and it's it's not a, a thing of only what you want to do it's a thing of figuring out what that painting can show you because that you know there's many kinds of artists and I'm not the kind that that has the idea and executes I'm the kind that doesn't know and feels my way through it and um questions constantly you know do I even know how to paint? Is this, is this a painting, you know, um, which, you know, maybe that, that falls in line with, um, the, like, um, the myth of the, the art, the struggling artist and all of that kind of thing. But to me, that is the only way I can make a painting. If mm -hmm. I, if I were to do what I know can happen, it would be very boring. Yeah. Yeah, that so, repetition day and day, yeah, the same thing. No. Yeah, so I think that when the painting shocks me in some way, or it arrives at something that I just feel like works on all those levels, you know, works in terms of content, a a, a feeling of a con the content finally um, presenting itself, and as well as the form and working like the light, the space, and the how it's working in an abstract sense. Mm, I love that. Weirdly, I have some paintings that I'll put in this next show that didn't go through the same process, th that not knowing, really like fighting through and in, in that fight, the the weird um, 
interaction between those layers. There's one painting or maybe there's two in there that don't have that. And I'm questioning them, but I'm also accepting them. Um, mm -hmm. And one of them started, a thing that happened in this past year is I started drawing with graphite pencil in my sketchbook, which I hadn't for when I was, you know, for many years, I kept a sketchbook and they had, you know, writing and drawings and sketches and none of them were preliminary. They were just, you know, things that I made. And the sketchbook that I've been keeping this past year, I've been drawing in graphite, which I haven't wanted to draw in since I don't even know undergrad. And um, it like forced me to change the language of how I think about form and um, how I think about Mark and it started to influence the paintings and the form is more clear and mm -hmm. composition is more of a, a driving part of it, which to me is something I, I haven't prioritized in a long time um, in the way that this seems to be working. Um, so it's interesting how those doing the drawings is changing things. But the other cool thing about the drawings is it's, it's allowing me to see things around me that I wasn't seeing as, as possible as possibilities for paintings. Um, mm -hmm. And um, the, the person that I'm in a relationship with, he's a big part of it because he's willing to sit for me for at first it started out as drawings and then it, it became paintings. But, um, and that's also not something that I had been investing into as a possibility for making a painting you know I've if I'm painting a person I, I really want it to be someone I know really well and not just a figure um mm -hmm. and I just feel really lucky that he's willing to do that and I don't know like now I'm I've got you know a painting in this show that has him shaving in the mirror with my shadow behind him or um you know, him sitting at a table or whatever, but all these drawings were the generative thing for thinking I might make a painting of that. Hmm. I love hearing about that, about going back into drawing, how it led to form. And now how you have these figures of somebody sitting there that are, that are in these paintings. I'm really excited about the show that you have coming up too. Um, so you have a show at Jupiter Contemporary in Miami, Florida. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about it? I love hearing about these paintings. Can you expand a bit? Yeah. So the, the show opens October 8th okay. and I'm really excited to be working with this gallery um I did, did an art fair with him last year and it was excellent and his he, he's so supportive and enthusiastic it's just incredible you know leading up to the show I feel so like just it's it's really like fueling me right now um but the 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 work in the show the show is called Simple Pleasures and the work really is um, in the simplest way based on indulging in things that I can love that are surrounding me in my immediate world, um, which I think over the past maybe three years the work has increasingly become something that would be something I would be afraid of. In the past, I would be a little wary of painting things that would get too close to seeming sentimental. Um, and, you know, painting the moon or painting as even a still life was something that I was like pushed away from me as a possibility. Um, and now I'm, I'm more interested in, I think it, more and more it's become, if there's a thing that I think I'm not supposed to do, what is that about? And then I start testing it, you know, one of the, I had a painting in um, the show that I did at Stephen Harvey's in 2018 called Signal. There was a painting in that show called iCloud, and it was a, a mirror on a wall of ephemera that I have, I always have and have always had. And I always have this like small thing on the wall that's just kind of a constellation of of things that have different associative things with them. And I had never painted that kind of flat wall, but also those things that are like really personal to me and, and thinking about love songs and thinking about um, the power of like a soul ballad and how it goes straight to this emotive thing that there's no shyness about being sentimental to the core, you know, and 
I thought about like, can it, can you do that in a painting? Um, so I made that painting thinking about that. So there's like, there's a layer, there's some references to Otis Redding in the painting and um, his song, you don't miss your water till the well run, runs dry. And I, I had like gone through a divorce. And so all of those things were in the painting. And I thought like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna make paintings that are meaningful to me in some way there will be ways in for the viewer and they will and, and and I'm going to go to the that thing of being sentimental without worrying about that you know and I, I think that um that's one of the things I definitely inherited I think from the first people I worked with was staying away from that you know being a very formal person who who looked at things as as a distant as a distant thing you know um Another thing that started to influence me is the looking at the unicorn tapestries at the the cloisters at the Met. I am really obsessed with them and I started drawing from them and doing drawings and graphite drawings and thinking about the language of them. Just, it just, I, I just ate it up, you know, I just kind of ingested it and something about the language of that keeps coming back up in the paintings. Um, and so just letting the things that, inspire you and feed you come into the work without fear you know of it being the wrong thing um and just being excited about what it what, what its potential can bring it sounds like a fantastic show of your work you know um I love hearing about like thinking about like a power ballad like a love ballad like there's no shame putting it all out there and then um how many times we can shy away. Mostly I think if you're formally trained, like you said, like I, I have the, the same thing. And what does it mean to put that in there? What is, what kind of artist does that make you, but then embracing it at a certain point. And, um, I can't wait to share images from the show. <laughs> I wish I could be in Florida to see all the work in person. Um, so congratulations on that show, simple pleasures. Um, what a great title too. I love that. Thank you. Well, well, Stephanie, this has been a pleasure. I just want to say thank you for taking the time, you know, out of your studio. I know you're prepping for this show and everything. So I really appreciate you jumping on here with me and talking about your life and your paintings and everything that's, that's really informing them. So thank you. Oh, I appreciate it so much. It's been so fun. Great to talk to you. Great to talk to you too. All right. Well, thank you for listening in everybody. And Stephanie, I'll let you get back to it. And I can't wait to share your upcoming show. Thank you. Take All care. Right, bye.